All right, hello, hello guys. Today we're talking all about testing mountaineering fitness. Now using fitness tests or fitness assessments as a mountaineer can be a really, really powerful tool in your preparations. However, I know so many mountaineers out there undervalue this and also misapply it into their prep. And I also know a lot of the information out there on this subject that's currently available isn't particularly amazing. So today I'm gonna to be diving into it in a little bit of detail, talk you through why testing is so important for mountaineers and some important points around testing which you need to be aware of to get the most out of them and also to also talk you through a number of assessments and tests which I use for my own clients who are training for a mountaineer and adventure and how you can apply them as for yourself so let's get into it so the most important thing on um, point when it comes to testing is basically the quote if you're not testing you're um, you are just guessing Meaning as you're going through your training process for a mountaineer adventure, obviously every single thing you're doing in your training, you want to be improving your fitness, your strength, or your resilience, or a combination of all three to for the end objective to get you ready for the mountain. Now, the issue if you're not testing is quite often you have no idea if your fitness is actually getting better. Sure, you might be feeling good, you might be feeling a bit fitter, or you might be feeling a bit stronger, but if you're not actually putting numbers and taking an objective measure of this, you're not 100% sure what is going on. The body changes so much day to day and your feelings and your perception of effort and your perception of progress might be a little bit distorted. So getting some numbers and getting some objective assessments around how you're progressing, if things are working for you are really, really important. So if you can go through eight weeks of training, you can do a test and you can say, whoa, I haven't actually improved at all. That means you need to change something in your training. Alternatively, if you do eight weeks and you're like, boom, everything's going up, everything's getting better, I'm on the right track and you can be confident that you can move forward. So testing is very, very important. Just simply to just take that guesswork out and turn into a little bit more scientific, a little bit more objective measure. Um, now assessments, as I said, can be a powerful tool to judge progress, but they also can be a powerful motivator as well. If you're coming through and testing every eight weeks or every six weeks, or whatever you're doing, and you're constantly improving, getting better and better, that does wonders for your motivation, that does wonders for your confidence, and all these mental aspects are so important for mountaineer in their prep, and leading into an adventure, feeling confident you've been doing the right things is a game changer for many people on the mountain. Um, now, assessments can be very, very simple, or they can be outrageously complex. There's 101 different assessments for every single thing you're looking at and when it comes to assessing your fitness and there's so many different ways of going about it in all honesty i personally really like keeping things simple and as simple as they can i feel like sometimes mountaineers tend to get a little bit too technical around this stuff athletes in general and a lot of the information out there online is just a little bit too convoluted so today i'm going to share you through a range of different options but most of it's going to be going down the simple route and things that you can do at home without any knowledge around sports science without any knowledge around physiology without having to fork out money to go to a lab you can literally apply this into your own week your own training and sort of get a good idea and a good and effective idea of how your progress is moving forward um, and then today basically what we're going to go through is what makes a good assessment for mountaineers and um, a few methods for assessing aerobic fitness lower body strength upper body strength and core endurance um, and a few examples of my favorite assessments for mountaineers which i personally use for my clientele so to start off with what makes a good assessment, there are a few key points you need to consider when you're considering what assessments to apply into your life and how to choose from the million and one ones out there. Number one, it has to be specific to your goals. As I said, there's so many assessments out there, but if you're choosing an assessment which has no relevance to your mountaineering success, it's not gonna be a great judge of your fitness. Classic example of this is the beep test. Now the beep test is this um, you know, old school fitness assessment, which you've probably done in high school, where you go up and down like 10 meters, go into the um, in time to these beeps, which get quicker and quicker and quicker. And it's said to be a really good judge of aerobic fitness. But when it comes to mountaineering, it really has very little relevance. The stop start nature of that, the running nature of that and all of that, it's just not relevant for mountaineering. But many people I see online who have no idea about you know, the intricacies of all this, they'll recommend things like the fitness test. So they'll recommend things that are very, very just not relevant to mountaineering at all. So you need to make sure you're choosing assessment which are relevant to the specific outcomes you're trying to train. So is it aerobic fitness? Is it muscle strength? Is it core endurance? What are those specific outcomes you need on the mountain which you're trying to measure? Um, number two is easily measurable. So every single assessment you need, you do, you want to be able to get numbers out of it. 
Now, if you're just doing a run and you sort of do a 10 kilometer run and you're not getting a time, you're not getting a heart rate, you're not getting any type of numbered measure and you're just like, hey, that felt good. And next time you do it, you're like, hey, that felt bad. It's a waste of your time. Sure, it could be a training session, but it's not an assessment. The same thing for any type of strength movements. If you cannot measure what you're doing in one particular way or any type of assessment you're doing, it's not worth your time. So you need to think, can I measure this? Is it easy to measure? And will I be able to get a good and accurate measure of what I'm trying to achieve? Next one, is it repeatable? So this is really, really important because if you're doing tests which cannot replicate exactly the same circumstances again and again and again, the outcomes are going to be invalid. For example, a common one mountaineers will do is a timed incline ascent in which they'll find a certain elevation gain and they'll be like, over this certain amount of time, I'm trying to do it and they take how quick they do it. Now, if you do that um, climb in your hometown, then eight weeks later, you're actually traveling for work and you do it in another town and the times are completely different, that's not going to be the same. Sure, you might have the same elevation. Sure, it might te technically be the same grade, but it's not going to be the same assessment. So you cannot think that that's going to be the same. So you, you need to choose either assessments which you can um, either going to be at your hometown where you're always going to be and you can repeat again and again and again in what you have access to at home. Alternatively, you need to choose assessments which are universal, meaning you can do in any space around the world, which typically come down to gym assessments, which you can sort of take out all those outside factors. So you need to be able to repeat it exactly every single time you do. Now, a common mistake I see in this as well, when people doing strength exercises, is they're not and being strict on the particular exercises. A classic example of this was when I was working in a previous gym. They used to do this um, fitness assessment for mountaineers and trekkers um, and other people um, every eight or 12 weeks. And they just did this mis mis mismatch of exercises. They did push ups, pull ups, sled pushes, um, stuff on the assault bike. And they just did all this stuff and they just did a bunch of repetitions for time. An issue with that was every single time they did it, they didn't judge and they weren't strict on the repetitions for the pull-ups and for the push-ups. So sometimes when people are doing it, they were doing full pull-ups. Sometimes they were doing full push-ups. Other times they'd go in and they would be doing these little half or three quarter pull-ups. They'd be doing these little half or quarter push-ups. And so they'd come down eight weeks later and the results can be completely skewed because they're like, well, I've just taken 40 seconds off my time, but I've also only done one legitimate push-up. So if you're doing this, you need to be strict on your, um, your guidelines and your protocol. So if you're doing push-ups, you have to say, whatever you choose, my chest has to hit the floor. Or if I'm doing pull-ups, my arms have to go completely straight. Or however you want to judge it, but it needs to be repeatable when it comes to that. Um, next one, simple. As I said before, it can get really, really complex. And in all honesty, simplicity is better. If, something, if you're looking at an assessment, and you're getting super confused about the protocol, you're getting super confused about the instructions, and you're getting a bit cross-eyed from all these numbers, it's not for you. Either you have to outsource that assessment to a coach or a professional who can do it for you, or you can find something that's simpler, which you can get your head around. And 99% of the time, you can find an alternative assessment, which is gonna give you a good enough measure, which is 10 times simpler. Sure, if you're an Olympic athlete or if you're a professional athlete, like triathlete or something, you might have to get those 100% accurate results. But if you are an amateur mountaineer or you're just a general mountaineer who wants to get ready for a big adventure, you can find an assessment which is good enough and it doesn't have to be that outrageously complex thing. Now, many people take this way too overboard. And personally, I like simple. Um, next one, a really, really important point is min minimal risk of injury. You don't want to be doing assessments that put you at any risk of injury at all. And this is something super, super important. So when I see people recommending one RM or one repetition maximum squat testing for mountaineers, meaning you're trying to load up as much weight as you possibly can for one repetition, that's mental in my eyes. No mountaineer needs to be doing 1RM testing. The risk way, 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 way outweighs the reward for that. And you need to really, really think, is this going to put me in a major risk of injury? The other example I've seen is people recommending uh, mountaineers do 30 minutes or it's like 60 minutes, I can't remember exactly, of box jumps and just see how many you can get. Sure, that's going to be a pretty decent test of muscular endurance and maybe aerobic fitness, but it's outrageous. You are going to get injured. You're going to hurt yourself and it's just not a good idea. So think minimal risk of injury. And then finally, these assessments need to be designed to identify any potential weaknesses or blind spots and not just identify your strengths. 
Meaning, when it comes to your strength assessments, mountaineers love to do squats, they love to do step ups, they love to do box jumps, all of which are judging more or less quad endurance and strength. Everyone does it, everyone loves it, and that's fair enough. However, every mountaineer's got strong quads already, and very, very rarely do I see any assessments which are judging hamstring or glute strength, which are just as important for mountaineers that everyone seems to overlook. And nine, nine, nine times out of 10, when I deal with a mountaineer and they come to see me, their quads are epically strong, but their hamstrings and their glutes are lagging behind. Now that is gonna put them in a limitation on the mountain, that's gonna put them at a higher risk of injury, and that's gonna put them in like reduced performance in so many situations. So if I can identify that, with an assessment and I can say, look, we need to work on this. That is super valuable. So for you, when you're choosing your assessments, don't just choose the ones where you're like, yeah, I can smash this. Choose a spread and a balance of assessments, which you can flag up a whole bunch of different things that need to be worked on. So now I've gone through all of that. I'm going to talk you through a number of different um, approaches for assessments to start with aerobic assessments. Now, obviously aerobic fitness, aerobic capacity is the single most important element of fitness for a mountaineer. So we want to be judging that progress as you go through to make sure your training is getting you fitter for the mountain. Really, really straightforward. Now there's a few different ways you can make up an aerobic assessment. So I'm going to talk you through them and I'm going to give you my favorite ones. Um, for First example is a set distance. So this is going to be um, where you just literally choose a set distance and you're just going to do that as quick as you can. So this might be, for example, here, the thousand foot step test, which I'm going to talk through in detail in a moment, um, which you say, look, I'm going to do a thousand feet equivalent of stepping. I'm going to do that as quick as I can, or I'm going to do a 10 kilometer run as quick as I can, or I'm going to do a, you know, a, a certain, a, a certain hike as quick, a 10 kilometer hike as quick as I can. Whatever it is, set distance, you're literally going for time. Pretty simple, pretty simple, but maybe people are pretty familiar with that. The next one is a set time. So you're going to say, look, I've only got 40 minutes and I have to get as far as I can. So I might do 40 minutes of climbing um, up a hill. I might do 40 minutes of stepping. I might do 40 minutes of running. And you're just keeping a track of how far you get. And then in eight weeks time, you can do 40 minutes of running again. And hopefully you get a bit further. Next one, set pace. So this one's where you're sort of limiting yourself to a very particular pace and seeing how far you can get um, or how long it takes you to do a certain distance. So two easy ways to, um, or two relevant ways for mountaineers, I should say, to judge this would be to say, I'm going to do a five kilometer run and I'm going to stick to nose breathing pace, meaning I'm going to close my mouth and I'm only going to breathe through my nose. What that's going to do is that's going to limit you to your um, aerobic energy system that's not going to let you work at a higher intensity um, and then you basically see how long it takes you to do it at your nose breathing pace this is really really relevant for sticking into your aerobic zones which is super super important for mountaineers and then you might do this in eight weeks time and all of a sudden all your training means you can work at a higher pace while still breathing through your nose meaning you've expanded the capacity of your aerobic system meaning your training is going well now, nose breathing can be relatively difficult for quite a few people. You can do the same thing as a conversational pace, though it's not quite as, uh, as, um, as easy to judge. The other thing is you can set yourself a heart rate target. So for the equivalent for the nose breathing would be something like 75% your max heart rate. Um, without even getting super complicated, without going like absolutely mental, you literally find 75% of your max heart rate, log it on your watch, log it on your heart rate monitor, and just sit at that 75% for the entire run or the entire hike or whatever it is and just see how long it takes you. Pretty straightforward, pretty, um, pretty relevant and very, very effective. And then the other way you can judge this is obviously do a bit of lab testing, which mountaineers do love to do. You do something like a gas exchange test, a VO2 max test, a blood lactate test. Um, as I said, all of these things are much more accurate, but you've got to sort of toss up. Um, if you're going to use this as a recurrent assessment, am I going to fork out the money every eight weeks to do this? Um, you can just use these as a one-time thing to figure out your training zones and figure out things like that. Um, completely up to you. Personally, I don't use these generally. I'll recommend a mountaineer does it maybe once at first to figure out their training zones. But in all honesty, doing this repeatedly, it's just a bit of a money suck and it's just a bit not necessary. So that is another option for you. Um, my two favorites for mountaineers that I generally get people to do is the 1,000 foot or 305 meter step test, which I'm going to talk you through in a moment, and a five kilometer nose breathing run or a run at 75% of their max heart rate for five kilometers. Pretty straightforward. That gives me a decent measure, a couple of decent measures um, to see if we're moving forward. Not complicated. Anyone can do it. And I really, really like them. So they're my aerobic assessments for mountaineers. 
Now, I want to talk you through this 1,000 foot step test um, so you get an idea of what it's all about. Um, this is not my assessment. This is created by the guys at Uphill Athlete who wrote the book Training for the New Alpinism. Super simple assessment, really, really relevant for mountaineers. can be done by absolutely anyone and can be done absolutely, absolutely anywhere. So basically what you want to do is find a box or a step which is about three quarters of the height up to your knee. Um, it doesn't have to be exact, but ideally about three quarters up to your knee. The key here is you always want to use the same height box. So if you're doing assessment one time and a slightly lower, one time slightly higher, it's going to be all out of wax. You need to find the right box. You're going to put, grab your pack. You're going to put 20% of your total body, body weight into your pack and put on your boots. Then you're going to get a tape measure out and you're going to get a calculator out and figure out how many steps are going to equal out a thousand feet or 305 meters with your particular step. Um, and then you're basically going to just do this as quick as you can and time how long it takes to do all of these steps. And then the key here is you want to use something to track your steps. So I got these little rep clickers, which I bought online. Um, I've seen people do um, just count in the head, which is a bit of a nightmare. Most phones, you can download an app with a rep clicker. Um, another coach I've worked with, he's recommended having a whiteboard, having a line and just putting a line, um, a straight line, putting a line down every time you do 20 repetitions or something like that. Um, whatever works for you, just make sure you get an accurate count here. Um, and then, yeah, and basically this is the assessment and it gives you an, a number to see if you're improving as you go through. It's all pretty straightforward. Now here's a little example of me doing it at home, um, which was absolutely boring as hell in the home isolation. And yeah, I will say this assessment is very, very boring, but it gives you a good judge. And um, for here, you know, I wasn't wearing my boots because I was doing it indoors during home isolation. So I didn't want to ruin my couch, but it gives you an idea of literally just step, 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 and try and do it as quick as you can. So I'd highly recommend that as a mountaineer. And that was created by the guys at Uphill Athlete. So next one's lower body assessments. So now we've done our aerobic assessments, we've got an idea there. We want to be judging a few different strength assessments to see if we need particular areas we want to work on. Um, basically, the key with lower body assessments is you want to assess both the posterior and anterior chain. Meaning, as I mentioned before, if you're just you're doing exercises which judge quad strength and endurance, nine times out of ten, you're going to be fine. You also want to be working um, judging the posterior chains, the hamstrings and the glutes to identify any potential weaknesses going on. Um, three assessments which I love for this for mountaineers. First one is something called the single leg rise assessment, which is a great assessment judging quadricep um, endurance and strength and also knee stability, which is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly relevant for mountaineers. Now, how you do it, basically you're going to find yourself a chair or a box in which when you're sitting down, your knees at 90 degrees, as you can see here. You're going to cross your arms across your chest and all you're going to do is literally just push up with one leg, up, down, up, down, just making sure it's all controlled so you're not dropping yourself down and you're just going to do as many as you can in a row. Really, really simple. Anyone can do it. And that's a really, really simple assessment I get most of my mountaineers to do. Next one, single leg glute bridge, and um, which is a great one for the hamstring and glute strength, specifically glute strength. So what you're going to do here, lie on the floor, foot nice and close to the bum, and um, other leg pointed out, arms crossed across your chest. And all you're going to do is push up through your heel, push your hips up to the sky, squeeze your glute, little pause, come down. And again, push up to the sky, squeeze, squeeze your glute, little pause, come down. And that one's looking at as many repetitions as you can. The key here is you're not just going bang, 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 but you've got to do that little pause at the top. And ideally you want to be feeling a squeeze in the glutes. So you can cheat on this assessment and just push through the quads. If you want to try to feel the glutes doing a reasonable amount of work. And then third lower body assessment, which I love is the single leg calf raise. So calves obviously for mountaineers take an absolute battering. You really need to make sure these are not um, deficient and they are progressing. So this is super, super simple. One foot on the floor, one foot back. You're in a leading onto a floor. You're going to basically push up. One second pause. A two second pause, I should say. One second lower. Push up. Two second pause. One second lower. And just do as many as you can on each leg. Now, you might be looking at this and you're like, whoa, Rowan, those assessments look super, super easy. You know, I can bang out a million of those and fair enough. Um, however, it is surprising how many mountaineers cannot reach the clearance scores on this, which is 22 repetitions on each leg for all of these. If you cannot reach the clearance scores, so 22 reps on each of these, you need a lot of work on that particular area. And that is a signal that you need to move forward. And you can use these assessments as a judge as you're getting over. If you can get to 22 repetitions, um, you have the option. You can either 
just do as many as you can. So you might end up doing a hundred repetitions of the single leg rise assessment, or you can make that assessment a little bit more difficult and progress these exercises slightly. So if you're one of the uh, mountaineers who can just bang out a whole bunch of pistol squats, you might substitute a full pistol squat for that single leg rise. Just do as many as you can and use that to judge your progress. Same thing for the single leg glute bridge. You could turn that into single leg hip thrust in which you put your shoulders behind a bench. So you increase that range of motion and you can as many as you can do there. And the same thing for the, um, for the calf raises. So you could either put your foot on a step. So you go your heel all the way down the floor and up to add a little bit of range. Alternatively, you could put a pack on your back um, with a little bit of weight and you could judge that as well. So that's your, those are your options there. But those three tends to cover most of the things you need for lower body. Um, and it gives you a really, really good idea. I'd highly recommend filming these as well. So you get an idea and you can watch sort of what changes. Like quite often with these um, single leg rise assessments, you'll see, um, I haven't got to go in here, but you'll see the knee doing all these crazy things, wiggling in, wiggle out. That's a really big, big indicator. You need to be strengthening up particular muscles and it's good to watch your progress there. So there are three assessments there. Now, the next ones for lower body assessments is the idea of testing under load. So putting a little bit extra weight. Now, what we were looking at those ones for mainly for endurance and as many repetitions as you can. However, with assessments, quite often we want to, um, we want to see how strong you are, basically in numbers. If you are trying to do your max strength training, that can be very beneficial. And it's also important to understand how your body acts under load. Now, your body, when it comes down to injury risk and when it comes down to dysfunction and all that, generally when you're fresh and when you're doing endurance work, it, there's not too much of an issue. You can do repetition, repetition, repetition. The body works fine and happily. However, it's when it gets fatigued, when it gets put under extra pressure that it's not used to, that's when things begin to break down slightly. And that's when you can identify if there's particular issues going on which you need to correct. So it can be a pretty good judge to put a little bit of a few lower body, um, lower body assessments under a bit of load. Um, and this can also be a great motivator and judge just to judge numbers moving forward as well. Um, so as I said previously, one RM testing is not necessary for a mountaineer. You do not need to be doing that unless you have a long history of powerlifting specifically. You don't want to be doing a one RM. It's just not necessary for a mountaineer. If they were testing, um, if they're confident in the weights room, if they're feeling good about their strength and they do love numbers, if you tick off all those three numbers, you might look at something like a, a three, a four or a five RM test in which you're doing three, four, five repetitions, as many as you can, um, as heavy as you can and getting numbers there. That can be an option. It's not essential, but it can be an option. Um, in all honesty, if you're doing this, get it judged by a coach because half the benefits of this type of thing is not just getting the number for your strength, but actually to see how your body moves throughout. So either get a coach to watch you doing that and run you through these assessments, or at the very least film them and find a coach to assess and look through and just give you some pointers around what's going on. It's really, really important because if you're just getting the number, you're missing out on half the benefits of these assessments. Now, if you're super confident with your weights and if you've done, got a big history of um, strength training and you've got no arm, um, no issues when it comes to injury with strength training or anything like that. These are a few assessments you might want to look at. So a 3RM front squat would be ideal if you can front squat, trying to get a judge on that. Alternatively, a 3RM back, back squat could be a good judge. Um, it could be 3 or 4 or 5RM, whatever you're comfortable for. This is if you're confident. Same thing with the barbell deadlift. So if you're quite happy deadlifting, you've got no issues, getting a 3 or 4 or 5RM deadlift to work off a number can be good. Um, and then also you probably want to do something on a single leg. So you might do a five RM um, barbell or step ups or dumbbell step up to get a judge on that because your step ups are going to be the number one exercise you need to improve. Super, super critical for um, mountaineering. So getting a judge if they're improving can be good. Um, if you're not confident, you probably want to be looking at something like maybe not a three or four or five RM, but you might just want to do a normal exercise under load. So you might do that single leg rise assessment, but just put on a weights vest. You might do the single leg, um, the single leg hip thrust, but just put on dumbbells and just see how many you can, how heavy you can get for 10 repetitions or eight repetitions. A lot safer, a lot easier, but it's still going to give us an idea of what's going on when the body is under load. So that's another option for you. If you're not a hundred percent confident around your heavy lifting. Um, this is an example of an assessment you could do. So the, the um, step up, if you were doing a step up assessment, you don't want a huge, super huge box. You'd be doing something low like this um, and you just keep on loading up and loading up until you can't do anymore. Pretty straightforward. 
Um, next one, we talked enough about lower body assessments. Now, upper body assessments. Now, upper body doesn't need a huge amount of time. It is important for a mountaineer. It is important, uh, more important the more you climb and the more technical you get. Um, but generally, you don't need to spend a huge amount of time assessing this. Two assessments I love. You only need two, in all honesty, for 95% of mountaineers out there. Number one, do you want to be looking at a pulling motion? So you either want to be doing pull-ups, as many pull-ups as you can. That can be any grip you want, whether it's underhand, neutral, or overhand. Or if you cannot do pull-ups, or if you can only do one or two, you can do incline rows, in which you get a barbell, you put yourself horizontal underneath, and you just row yourself up as many times as you can. They're your two options, and just bang out as many as you can. The other one is you, if you want to be obviously looking at the other side of the body, so not just your pulling, but also your pushing. So you want to be choosing either dips, body weight dips off the bar, um, parallel bars, or push-ups. They're your two options. You don't need to do both. I don't know why mountaineers think they need to do both. Exactly the same assessment, in all honesty, um, and as many as you can there. Suss that out, pretty straightforward. Now, if you're testing under load, which you probably would want to do as well, you just want to put a bit of load on these exercises. So you do load of pull-ups and you try and get like maybe a three RM of this, of putting, you know, a weights, uh, a belt with dumbbells attached and just see how much, how heavy you can get for three RM. Same thing for your loaded dips. Or you could do, if you're doing a horizontal row, um, you could put a weight on your chest or a push-up, you could put a weight on your back. You could do something like a barbell, um, you know, a bench press, but I don't think it's super relevant. I think those are the four ones you can look at. Um, and I would say if you've got the time, do all four. And um, if you don't have the time, just choose either the under load or the not under load, whatever you prefer. Um, which is better, completely up to you. It doesn't really matter. And um, it's really what you're looking at. If you feel like you're deficient in strength, then that's something you need to work on. Maybe doing the load, you know, the load of testing. If you feel like you need to work on endurance a bit more, maybe do the endurance testing. Whatever you prefer there. Um, and clearance scores on this, I haven't actually given clearance scores on like standards, what you want to aim for, in all honesty, because this just varies so much from person to person. Um, I would say just get a score for yourself at the start and just try and build it up. Whatever you're looking for, just try and build it up and keep on going more and more and more. So there's not a particular number you need to aim for, but just build it up from whatever you get. For your core, core is really, really simple. Um, in all honesty, don't waste time with sit-ups. I don't know why people judge their sit-ups on this. It's just not relevant it's a waste of time and trying to do quick sit-ups it's mental it's just not it's not worth your time um plank is honestly the easiest way to judge this and there's so many more complex things you can do with a coach but if you're doing this by yourself literally holding a plank position for as long as you can is a good judge um if you feel like you can hold the plank for a stupid amount of time so five minutes six minutes seven minutes eight minutes probably put a bit of load on your back so put a five or ten kilo plate on your back or wear a weights vest or something like that um, the clearance score here on a normal plank, if you can't do a three minute minimum plank, you got a lot of work to do before you get onto the mountain. Um, but if not, then you just want to keep on building that up um, with either load or whatever you can do. And that's a really easy judge. Um, and again, there's a million ways you can do that, but that's the easiest thing people can do at home. So now you've gone through all the assessments. When do you want to be testing? Number one, first week of training, if possible. Um, trying to get the, those raw numbers initially can be really, really good. You don't really want to do it every single week. I know people love doing tests every single week, man, and people love you doing it every couple of weeks. But if you're testing all the time, it's going to detract from your actual training. So I don't recommend that. Generally, you want to be looking at every four to eight weeks, probably more to the eight weeks, depending on how long you're doing. Um, and also at the end of any type of training phase. So if you're at the end of your transition phase, if you're in your max strength phase, Probably not at the end of just before you go on your trip. It's not necessary. But um, yeah, every four to eight weeks is probably a good idea. Now, if things aren't improving, if you're doing your tests and you've done eight weeks and all of a sudden you're timed, your step test hasn't improved, that means, well, you've got to have a serious look at your training. You're like, are there areas that you haven't really planned out and you're just doing random training? That's a sign that your training needs some structure. Are you doing structured sessions, but they're not really getting the results you want? That's when you need to reach out for professional help and get some another opinion. Um, and if you're working off a training program and it's not doing what you need it to be doing, then you need to ask yourself the question, am I doing this right? Or am I got the right training program for me? So this is sort of where you come where the value of it comes in. If you are not improving, you know, something needs to change. Um, and with this film as much as you can as well. So all the strength assessments, film them. And um, because as I said, 
the way that your body moves and the way that your body changes um, each time you test is a really, really good indicator of what's going on. And also you can use this data, bring it to a coach and you can say, look, this is what's going on. And it really, really helps the coaching process as well. Maybe not the aerobic assessments. You don't need to film them because they'll go forever, but film as much as you can with this stuff and then get help. If you need um, help, putting these assessments together, putting them to place. If you need help deciphering them, if you've done the assessments and you're like, how do I improve X, Y, and Z? If you are doing the, your training and it's not improving, if you want someone to decipher what's going on in your body, if you want someone to actually decipher some things a little bit more complex and understand injury risk and take you through some more specific assessments around, you know, ankle range of motion, hip range of motion, all of that jazz, get help, reach out to professional um, and they can help you with all of that. This is all designed for the do-it-yourself, for the amateur mountaineer. But if you do need extra help, get help. And um, it's probably worth investing there. So in summary, if you're not testing, you are just guessing. So don't guess with your prep, particularly if you're leading up to a big adventure. Make sure you know what's going on. Make sure you know if you're improving or not. Make sure you're identifying um, not just your strengths, but also your weaknesses and blind spots because don't want to be finding out weaknesses when you're on the mountain. You want to be finding them and overcoming them in your training. Um, if you're looking at movement screens, as I mentioned before, if you're trying to identify, you know, if you have restrictions in your ankles or your hips or your shoulders, or if you've got particular movement dysfunctions or anything like that, that's out of the scope of this video today. Unfortunately, if you do want a bit of help with that, send me a message. I'm more than happy to um, talk you through some of that. And there's a whole bunch of different assessments I do with my mountaineers. Um, but it's a bit beyond the scope of this video. If you do need extra help, reach out to me, rowan at summitstrength.com.au. Always happy to answer questions or expand on what I talked about. Um, or you can find me um, if you do need extra help with your preparation, with your training, getting ready for a mountain or applying these assessments, go to www.summitstrength.com.au. You can find me there and all my information around the training for mountaineering, which I very much love. So I really do hope you've enjoyed this um, video today, guys. I hope you got a bit of value out of it. I hope you have an idea around how you can assess your fitness for your mountaineering adventures and how you can sort of apply this into your training. So as I said, any questions, reach out. But if not, have a good one and we'll talk to you very soon. Bye.